Good morning. How is everybody today? Excellent. It's a nice day. Uh, why don't you join with us and stand as we uh, sing His Mercy is More.
to those around you. Welcome them this morning. Then you can turn this way and we'll wave to you up here. <laughs> and you may be seated. Well, good morning. Welcome to uh, Bible Baptist Church. We are so glad uh, for you to be able to join us and for us to be here and praise the name of our Lord Most High. Isn't he amazing? And we get to praise him for endless days. Man, uh, something to worship. And so with that, we like to start now with several opportunities that we have coming up. Um, announcements in your bulletin. So if you would please take out your bulletin, and I'd like to just highlight a few things. First off, um, I'd like to highlight our college and outdoor social on August 28th at 7 p.m. And so if you are a college student or young adult, uh, this event is for you. And so you have uh, a phone number within the bulletin um, regarding more information about that if you have questions. Next week, our missionaries, uh, Doug and Sharon Fry, are from Portugal. And they're going to be coming here and um, sharing with you about what God has done in them and through them uh, during this time. So please uh, join us next week and ready just to encourage and praise God for what he's doing through them and their ministry. Um, for the students, we have the Praise and Prayer Night coming up next week. And this is on Sunday night. 
um, from six to seven, and this is a student-led event for the entire church, for you. And so we just um, want to bring the church together, and this praise and prayer night is something that we do in our youth ministry quite often. Um, because we had to end short, we are moving it to right now, inviting you guys to join us. We're going to be outside, and so it's just going to be acoustic and singing to God and getting into smaller groups and praying over several different topics. So please join us for that. And then afterwards at 7 p.m., um, if you'd like just to fellowship and hang out and have some fun, we'll be running a couple games for the next 30 to 45 minutes or so uh, um, just to have fun before we head home. And then TC Cares is a yellow handout in your bulletin. And this is an outreach of giving to be able to give to several people, uh, uh, families in our community here in Traverse City and uh, with needs that they might have. And so several of those needs are listed there. And so please look through that and consider how you might help, whether it's giving or volunteering or how you might be a part of that. And that is a great event to be able to do. Awana is starting September 16th, and we are excited about this. But we are still in need of some volunteers and some helpers uh, to, be, to be able to lead these students. Awana is a great ministry uh, to be able to be a part of and helping kids know more about Christ, memorize scripture, have a ton of fun, and um, it's all wrapped up in one night. And so please consider being part of it. If you want to be a part of it, please fill this out and then uh, put it in the offering plates on your way out. Lastly, we have our fall campaign starting um, in two weeks in, in September, and so we, uh, it's called the Power of Jesus Names, and this is by Dr. Tony Evans, and he, uh, this is just to help us focus on who Jesus Christ is and studying him in a deep way within your small groups. If you are already a part of a small group, if you're not a part of a small group and would like to be one, uh, what they are, we just kind of break up into people's homes and we study God's word, we have fun, we pray together, and that is, um, and so if you are already part of one or would like to be a part of one, please fill this out. <laughs> we need to know that um, just who you are and be able to update our contact information for that. So please help us out no matter who you are, we'd love to for you to be a part of this and, and study this. And so we have a video of uh, just um, showing you what the study is about. Names matter. There is absolutely no name that matters more than the name of Jesus. The Bible makes it clear that at his name, every knee will bow, that at his name, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Jesus didn't keep them from the pain, but his I amness joined them in the pain. That's why throughout the book of John, him declaring himself that I am means that he's relevant to the present tense of your reality. So it's absolutely critical that you embrace Christ as your savior because he's your priest who covers you. He's your lamb who was sacrificed for you. He's everything you need. You see, his name is Emmanuel. Oh yeah, God is with us, but you keep your faith in him because it also means God is with you. So wear his name, bear his name, and share his name. So take advantage of this great name of Jesus, this great name of Jesus Christ. That's not his last name, that's his role. For Jesus to be Lord, he must not simply be prominent, he must be preeminent. It's not just how you move your lips, it's how you run your life. Jesus doesn't alpha what he doesn't omega. And if you will get started with him and keep walking with him, he will bring you to a conclusion for his glory, your good, as you're conformed to his image. But if you will embrace Jesus as your savior, God will forgive your sin, past, present, and future, give you eternal life, and give you a better life in history. That is the rescuer, and his name is Jesus. A couple weeks ago, Pastor Joel spoke on Caleb, 
and the story uh, that led him to the, his mountaintop one day. Um, as I've been thinking a lot about Caleb the last couple of weeks, just thinking about how a man who was devoted to God, did what God asked him to do, went in, had all the confidence in God, and then his dream was delayed 40 years as he walked through the desert. There are times in our life when we feel a lot of struggle, a lot of hardship. Um, look around the auditorium today and all the empty seats and how COVID has caused such a struggle in our lives right now. But t Psalm 2713 says, I would have despaired had I not believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. We have hope. We have something here. We know that God does do good things right now in our present life. And for those of us who believe one day, it's going to get a whole lot better. So as we take every step, just know that every step takes us higher. Every step takes us closer to him in the day that we will rise. Will you stand with us as we sing? There's a peace I've come to know Though my heart and flesh may fail There's an anchor for my soul I can say it is well Jesus has overcome And the grave is overwhelmed The victory is won He is risen from the dead And I will
still my soul, the Lord is on thy side. Bear patiently the cross of grief or pain. Leave to thy God to order and provide. In every change, he faithful will remain. Be still, my soul, thy best, thy heavenly friend, through thorny ways leads to a joyful end. Be still, my soul, thy God doth undertake to guide the future as he has the past. Thy hope, thy Before we get into God's word, um, there was an announcement that I missed, <laughs> and so we're going to have uh, one of our elders, uh, Mr. Mortensen, come up and share this announcement. Sorry. You didn't miss nothing. <laughs> All right. <laughs> nerves. His nerves. Good morning. Uh, just uh, an update in regards to our uh, third past, our oral search. Uh, our search committee has been pretty busy the last few weeks. Uh, 
they have received uh, a resume and much, much more and through that process. <clears throat> last week it got to a point to where they uh, made a recommend recommendation to the elder council to take this one more step. So with that being said, that step was uh, unanimously agreed upon to keep on moving forward. So um, comes Monday, Monday evening, tomorrow evening, uh, we will have our first uh, video chat with this gentleman. And uh, so we just ask that all of you would be in prayer as we continue through this process and for wisdom, discernment, and just guidance and uh, for God's leading. And we just uh, trust in him that he'll provide uh, whatever that outcome is. We look forward to, to that. So continue to be in prayer for this gentleman, be in prayer for us as we continue on with this process. Thank you much. All right, let's, uh, let's just pray for, about that and then also just for our hearts as we open up God's word. Father, thank you so much uh, for just how you um, provide for us and how you walk with us each step of the way. Lord, um, no matter what our lives, our families, our hearts are going through right now, I pray that we will be still, that we'll trust in you and that our faith will be built up um, through your word and even during this time of interviewing this gentleman, that you will, uh, Lord, um, bring clarity to, to, to both of us. <laughs> Lord, um, so please uh, work in us and through us, and thank you for watching over us. I pray that our hearts will be open and our ears will be open to see you and to hear you and to know you more. So in this we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So we're in a series called Family by God's Design, and God has designed the family to look a certain way. And so with that, um, we've, we've uh, given the foundational, just biblical teachings on what the family is and how, that, um, and how we can live out God's design for our families. With that, I would like to bring all of that together. And so in thinking about your family, what, what I desire as a parent <laughs> is for my family to be unified. But I just don't want my kids and all of us to be close. I want us to be unified around Christ. And I hope your desire is the same, is that your kids and your spouse and your marriage and your whole family will be centered around Christ, unified around him. And one of the biggest ways we can lead in this and do this is in the way that we communicate with each other, in how we communicate with each other. So whether you're a, a child, a kid living at home with your parents, or you're married, or whether you're single, or whether you're you know, a grandparent, or wherever you're at in your family, you have a job and you have a part to play of how you communicate to either bring unity or disunity, to either bring people closer to Christ or farther away. We each play a role. So, what we're gonna be looking at today is in Ephesians chapter four. Ephesians chapter four. And communication in your family is just hard. <laughs> it's difficult, isn't it? Communication, um, I, I read that clinical psychologists say, say, have said that in communication between two people, the message that is transmitted works out like this. About 10% of what you communicate is dependent on the words that are spoken. 35% on the tone of voice, and 55% on your body language, gestures, facial expression, and nonverbal dimensions in, that accompany our speech. Think about that. Only about 10% of what the words that you say are actually what's communicated. So much is taken in through your facial expressions, the tone that you have. And, and so even saying the right thing in the wrong way can cause an argument. Right, men? Um, just leave that there. 
So how does your family communicate? <laughs> so often we, we, we want to be understood rather than to understand someone else. We want to feel like people are listening to us, like we're valued, like we're important. So we want to be understood, and we often fight to make our point if people aren't listening or understanding us, rather than seeking to understand the other person. This causes arguments and the, right to, uh, and the need to be right and division in the family. Some families, in extreme cases, you know, um, have even just given up on communication to where it is a common thing, especially in the teenage years, for people to all be divided in their own rooms, watching their own devices, enjoying their own life, and, and interacting actually very little with each other. And so it's like, we need to communicate in a way that brings our family together around Christ, and how do we do that? Communication, uh, um, God desires us to communicate in a way that shows people who Jesus Christ is. And so look at Ephesians chapter 4, and um, we're, we're going to actually kind of get some context and look, start at verse 22. Um, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 22, it says, Put off the old self, which belongs to the former manner of life, and is corrupt through deceitful desires. And to be renewed in the spirit of your minds. And to put on the new self created after like, the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. And so, <laughs> just want to draw out is in verse 24, it says that we are to put on this new self. So, put something off, renew your mind, think differently about it, and then put on this new man that is created. So what we're supposed to put on, God creates, and it's the likeness of God. And so we are to be like God, and it describes it as true righteousness and holiness. And so we, that is what we're after, is to communicate in a way that shows that the likeness of God, and that shows that this is true righteousness, this is righteous, and this is holy, and this is what it looks like. And so... Notice, um, yeah, okay, continue in verse 25. This is where it jumps into communication. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each of you speak the truth with his neighbor. For we are members one of another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal. Rather, let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. And so I'd like to just to run through kind of the standard of what it is to be truly righteous and holy in the way we communicate. And so we look at, we see that in verse 25. It begins to put off the, uh, um, put, put off all falsehood and let each of you speak the truth with his neighbor. Truth, telling the truth. Uh, that, that unity in how we communicate must begin with the truth. <laughs> it must begin that we are honest. And the truth is defined for us. It's mentioned several times in chapter 4. Notice it in verse 15. It says, um, rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ. So we are to speak the truth, but do so out of love. If you tell the truth, but there is no love, then you're not going to get people to help them to become more like Christ. And you yourself are not going to be able to become like Christ. Our goal of becoming like Christ is only achieved as we speak the truth, but do so out of love. And so it's this love of putting them before us. And so you speak the truth out of love. Secondly, in verse um, 20, yeah, in verse 20 it says, but this is not the way that you learn Christ, verse 21, assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus. 
Jesus defines the truth for us. He embodies it. It flows from him. Its source is from Jesus Christ. It comes from God. And so for us to tell the truth, we are sharing Christ with people. And we must begin by speaking honestly and speaking the truth to people. But this is very uncomfortable. It is far easier to lie. It is far easier to hide. It is far easier to, instead of admitting to something that you don't want to admit to, to just ignore it. Right? And this says, no, you can't do that. It begins with something that's going to humble you. The truth. That's how you communicate. Why? Because we're a part of the body of Christ. And so to lie to, you, to, lie to somebody is to, like, cut a finger. It's harming yourself. It's your body that you're a part of, and you are damaging yourself and other people within your body that are there to help you, and you're to help them to grow up into Christ. Why would you do that? And so it's this renewal of the mind of of thinking differently that I cannot lie, I must tell the truth, because we are united together in Christ. Secondly, it says, be angry and do not sin, do not let the sun go down on your anger. I think this is awesome. Um, be angry. <laughs> um, I don't know for you, but anger for me is usually not something that anybody wants me to be, right? Um, usually that, that's a bad thing, and, and for good reasons. Is anger when it's there to say, it's about me. It's about me being understood. If, if I get angry because I've been hurt, it then becomes about me defending myself. That is not the anger of God or of Jesus Christ. He is, what makes him angry is the sins that people commit because they are not only hurting themselves, but they are damaging, they are misrepresenting Christ. They are damaging the, the uh, image of God. Does that make sense? And so you are to be angry. And the thing with that is so many times is we're complacent. We don't care enough, and if we do care, it's, it's personal. It's because it hurt, hurt me. That's when it matters. And here it says, no, you need to be angry because it is misrepresenting God, because it is harming God. But this anger is to be like God. And how is God's anger described? That he is slow to anger. Many of us, men, right, everybody, we're quick-tempered, quick to get there. It's like, no, we need to be very slow to become angry. And then we need to let go of it very quickly and forgive. It says, don't let the sun go down on your anger. Don't hold on to it. Don't let it fester. Anger that that you hold on to quickly becomes sin and out of control. And that's not what this is talking about. This is a very controlled anger. Something I really personally is like, I don't know how often I've experienced that. <laughs> you know, usually I'm angry. It's not a good thing. But here it says, no, anger is from God. It's not that it's a bad thing, but it's not about you. Does that make sense? All right, so be angry. Second, uh, third is stealing. Verse 28, it's, it says, let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands that we that he may have something to share with anyone in need. And so here, um, this is the only one that doesn't talk about our communication, uh, what you uh, say with your words. But stealing is something that takes place usually around people who are very familiar, meaning the primary people to steal from your family will be in your family, not outside of it. And that's just generally what happens. The number one thief in any business, like, Target or anything like that, when I worked there, they they told me this, is um, not the customers, it's the employees. (laughs) You know, and so it's the people closest to you that steal from you and say, no, no, don't steal, don't don't take from people, but rather work honestly. Well, you're like, yeah, yeah, we need to work honestly, but it's not for yourself. Your work is to be motivated, this is confronting, to give to the needs of others. (laughs) And so it's this idea that it's completely different kind of worldview. I'm working not for me and my family necessarily, but out of that to also help other people. It's a completely other-centered uh, way to, to live. And then lastly, in verse 29, it talks about our words. It says, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth, only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. 
And so here, it's, it's saying that our words need to be building other people up. It, they need to be not about building ourselves up and tearing them down like so commonly is, but to, to build the other person up, to, to encourage them. It is, it is yours to speak so that it's grace to the hearers, so that as they hear it, it fits the occasion. It's helpful. And if something doesn't fit, then you don't say it. And this is hard, right? James 1, 19 through 20 says, you know, let every man be quick uh, to, well, let me just read it. Know this, my beloved brethren. Let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. And so we're supposed to be quick to hear and then very slow to speak and slow to anger. So often it's the reverse order. We speak without listening, without hearing. Uh, something I, when I, was, uh, talk, when I was researching for students about communication last year or a couple of years ago, I came across this, that if you, when you listen to other people, when you listen to somebody, you are fulfilling almost every emotional need that person has. They feel accepted and loved and cared and valued and respected. And so it's like if we would just listen to each other, but we are so slow to listen and quick to speak, quick to get angry. And here, uh, Paul is saying, no, let your words be gracious and encouraging to them. So I don't know about you. I look at this list and I'm like, wow. Um, yeah, how, how are we doing? <laughs> how do we communicate like this? How does this become a normal habit for us? And the thing is, is that we are in a battle. We are in a battle um, against sin and Satan over our hearts, is that we are constantly being attacked so that we do not communicate this way, so our families are not united around Christ, but that we are divided or that we are united around something else that doesn't really matter. And so for us to communicate in this way, it takes meaning that we get into the battle. And something that's very convicting for me as a leader of my home and a man is to think that I can put so much leadership and an effort into my job. When I come home, isn't it true that we like to just check out? And it's like, no, we can't do that. We need leadership more in our home. That should be our primary job. That's when we check in, clock into work, is when we get into home, right? And so that's been convicting for me. And so how, how do we do that? Well, here are two truths to remember that we need to remember in order to communicate well in this way. First truth is that you fight an enemy over your heart. Notice what it says in verse uh, 27. Verse 27, it says, And give no opportunity to the devil. <laughs> the devil is the name that means slanderer or adversary. And he, we have a very real enemy. It is not the person it is, uh, that you're arguing with. It's not your spouse. It's not your parents. It is not your kids. It is the devil. And so he is there. Um, it says in 1 Peter 5, 8, Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. He's after to destroy you and your family. And he wants to devour you like a lion does its prey. And so you need to be watchful, on guard, beware of it, and be uh, uh, guarded against it. You are in a battle, and you need to fight against it. So often we communicate, and we're not fighting. We're fighting against the people rather than for the people. And so we need to fight for our family. Uh, the word, the name devil, is the name that is used when, when he tempts Jesus in Matthew chapter 4. And just as he tempts Jesus to doubt God and not to trust God and worship somebody else, so he tempts us in the exact same ways. And so uh, the devil wants a foothold. He wants to get into the doorway of your life. He wants to appear to you as a friend who is here to help you, help you satisfy your desires in the very best way apart from God. And he wants you to just invite him in, sit on the couch, and, and so he can drag you down with him. 
He is a lion seeking to devour you and your family. And he's after your heart. Why is he after your heart? Notice what it says in verse 31. It says, um, verse 31, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. <laughs> this pictures like the last argument I had, probably for you too. Notice what it says. Bitterness. That's like frustration that we often feel in the beginning of, for whatever reason. We begin to feel frustrated and bitter, and this turns into wrath. It's, 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 it's beginning to boil within us, and it's starting to spew out, and it turns into anger to where now, you know, people can tell by the tone and the mood that you're in that you're not in a very good mood and you have something to say. And so they might confront you on it, and immediately anger flows out of, of attacking them because you're ascribing to them motives, maybe, that aren't really even there, just in your head. Have you ever done this? Um, and then from there, it goes to uh, clamor and and slander, and that's just the nonsense of just spewing anger and spewing and attacking them uh, right out, and slander is more of a specific name calling, destroying their reputation, gossiping about them to other people, and that leads just to malice, which is just evil. Any, any, uh, any way you can attack and can get back at to them, you're now taking an action to do it. Wow. And here he kind of spells this out. And where does the action flow from? A heart of bitterness. It comes from inside of you. In verse 22 of chapter 4, it, spell, it, it, it highlights this and says, To put off your old self, which belongs to the former manner of life, and is corrupt through deceitful desires. So your, your enemy is not just the devil outside of you, it's your own heart, your own deceitful desires, that you desire things to... to uh, you, your desires are selfish, and they're deceived. They're twisted. They're corrupted. And Satan takes those desires, and it's so easy to tempt us and for us to fall into this pattern. And so how we communicate flows from our hearts. And whoever controls your hearts controls your life. What is in you will come out of you. Make sense? And so when we are uh, communicating, we need to communicate in a way that is about fighting for our hearts. Second truth is you fight sealed by the Holy Spirit. Notice um, verse 30. Uh, sorry, let's go back. There's one quick point about fighting. It says to put off, to lay aside, to get rid of it, is that we are not to go ahead and, and uh, treat this as a pet that we sometimes feed and like to ha hang around every once in a while. We need to get rid of it, slam the door, shut it out of our life, fight against it, take it off, hate it. This is your enemy, and you need to treat it as such, that it will destroy your family if it sticks around. So put it off. So, all right, so second truth, you fight sealed by the Holy Spirit. Now verse 30. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. And so um, here it says that you're sealed by the Spirit. This is amazing. Um, go to chapter 1, verse 13. This is where it first mentions the sealing of the Spirit. It says this in verse 13. For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints. Oh, sorry. That's 15. Let's go to 13. Um, in him, you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. The moment that you believe in Jesus Christ, God sends his spirit to seal you. Now think of that. You're sealed. You're secure. You are, uh, you are stamped and, and, uh, and within the Holy Spirit. Nothing can take you away. Nothing can destroy this. Nothing can separate you from God and his love. Because the Holy Spirit has sealed you. This is amazing. 
This is one of the amazing verses that has really uh, helped me be very secure in my salvation. It's this truth that we are sealed by the Holy Spirit. And notice, um, it, it motivates us in two ways. The first is, is a negative way. It says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit. And what the sealing of the Holy Spirit allows me to do is it gives me time and space to change. Because when we communicate this way, we're going to do it imperfectly, right? We're going to mess up. We need time and space to change. We need the grace of God to be overabounding, superabounding, overflowing over our sins that we commit <laughs> because we are constantly sinning. And so it's like, man, we, the sealing of the Spirit allows me to change. Change is possible because the Spirit has sealed you. Without the Spirit of God, you would not be able to change. There would be no hope for any of us. But because the Spirit of God has sealed us and secured our salvation, we don't have to worry about losing it. We can pursue Christ and fail and fall in a way, but continue to pursue Christ, continue to, to strive for him because the Holy Spirit has secured us. Make sense? And then it, it, it motivates us in this way. It says that it, do not grieve the Holy Spirit. So um, the Holy Spirit is living within you. He, he, he's, he's secured you. He saved you. He's brought a new heart into you to change you from the inside out. And if you continue to live in sin and not care and act like it's not enough and inconsequential, you are grieving the Holy Spirit. Why would you do that? A person who has been saved by the very grace of God should desire to please him and pursue him with all of their heart. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit. This is God. And he has sealed you. Notice what it says now, until the day of redemption. The day of redemption, so good. You're going to get to the presence of God. There is no failure that is going to overcome this or separate you from it. Like, think of it. The sins and the way we communicate in our arguments aren't going to last. The selfishness within us that causes our families to be divided is not going to last. Something is going to bring us until the day of redemption. And that day of redemption is the moment that we are truly righteous and holy before God. Not as a slave to a master, but as a father to a son. We get to enjoy the very presence of God. This is secure. It will happen. There is no doubt in it. Pursue Christ. Change. Communicate in this way. Why? Because you're powered by the Holy Spirit. You have him within you. Make sense? And when he is in your heart, what does that look like? Verse 32. Verse 32 says, Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. And so what we see here is we see kindness, a tender-hearted or compassion, your version might say, and forgiving one another. So we see the cycle in verse 31 from bitterness to anger, to clamor and slander, to malice. You see that cycle going around. And people are angry because they're hurt. <laughs> when they get angry and they say, I'm mad, often our defenses go up and we begin in attack mode. Well, I'm going to defend myself and attack you back, right? And so how, how do we break this cycle from responding to people out of our pain and out of hurt? Because when people are angry, what they're really saying is, I'm hurt. And if they would say, I'm hurt, we would approach it a whole lot differently. <laughs> we would say, oh, I want to understand you. Let me help you. Let me um, uh, be patient with you. But so often, <laughs> we don't hear that, right? So how do we go from a heart filled of bitterness to a heart filled with kindness and, and compassion and, um, and forgiveness towards other people? And it's the last few words of this verse. Just as God for, in Christ forgave you. That we are to, it is at the cross of Jesus Christ that our communication becomes different. He changes our hearts from the inside at the cross of Jesus Christ. God's forgiven you. God has forgiven you. God has been kind to you. God has shown you compassion. 
And it's like, when you are seriously overwhelmed by that forgiveness, it fills your heart to now you're more forgiving to others. But it comes at the cross of Jesus Christ. Um, all communication must lead people to the cross in order to promote change. Is that your, you need to communicate as one who is coming from the cross and leading people back to the cross. Does that make sense? Our, our conversations is about leading people to Jesus Christ and being unified around him. And so it's like, man, let, let, let's seek him and do that. And so um, it is at the cross that this cycle is broken. When we remember that God's forgiveness of, of us through Christ, then we change because the spirit is within us. So let's evaluate our lives. How are we communicating? <laughs> and um, this starts out just like it does in verse 25 with the truth, with being honest. And that means that do we need, who, who do we need to apologize to? Do we, do we need to apologize to someone? Is there an argument? Is there some type of uh, division within our family that we need to humbly come and say, I've messed up. I'm sorry. Forgive me. And then for the other side of it, are there people you need to forgive? And that's extremely difficult. Are there people that you need to forgive? But remember the cross of Jesus Christ and look to Jesus Christ. He's forgiven you freely. So freely forgive other people and, um, and let the cross overwhelm and change the way you communicate so you communicate for a change. Make sense? Something we all need to work on, but um, I am so glad that the cross of Jesus Christ, the spirit within us, <laughs> is within us, empowering us to do so so we can change. So let's communicate for a change. Let's pray. Father, <laughs> Thank you so much for your son, Jesus Christ, for his forgiveness on the cross. I pray that we will know the love and forgiveness of God, of you, through your son, Jesus Christ. That our words will be filled with grace to, to benefit and help those who hear. And that we will be empowered by your spirit who has sealed us for the day of redemption that you may be glorified in the way we communicate. Unite our families around yourself, around your son, Jesus Christ. Use us to do so, I pray. Whether we are a child, whether we're a parent, whether we're a grandparent, use us and help us to communicate in this way. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to end our service with the first song that we sang. Um, and the chorus just fits in with Dan's message so, so well with, his mercy is more, stronger than darkness, new every morn. Our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. So will you stand with us and sing this song? What love could remember, no wrongs we have done. A mission called no winky counts up.
missed. Father, thank you so much for your mercy and being more than our sins. Lord, may we communicate for change. Use us in our families to unite our families around Christ, I pray. And, and bless us as we go out, Lord, by the power of your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. As you guys uh, leave, uh, just to let you know, there are offering plates on either side of the door there that you can give your offering if you have. So have a wonderful week. <laughs>